but that's a good one. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Deuteronomy tonight, please. Deuteronomos, the second giving of the law. Deuteronomy, chapter number 13. And verse number 4. Deuteronomy chapter number 13 and verse 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and you shall serve Him, cleave unto Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Look at this. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones, that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall, fear, shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. Bless your word, Lord. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now what you read is a very stern warning. And I hope you caught the gist of it, even if it kind of includes your wife, your son, your daughter, your brother. If they turn from the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel in the Old Testament to take them and have them stoned to death. I believe this is where the Apostle Paul went when he took Stephen. They laid the coats of Stephen, uh, laid their coats at, at the feet of Paul when they stoned Stephen to death. I believe the Apostle Paul had letters to the churches in Damascus or to the believers in Damascus to bring them back and have them stoned to death. And this, of course, was his, his, uh, his authority for doing that. That's tough stuff, don't you think? How many of you tonight are glad you don't live under that? Amen. Amen. What is the Hebrew Roots Movement? Broadly speaking, follows the HRM, believe that all believers in Christ are obligated to follow Jewish laws and practices from the books of Moses. In some groups, extra-biblical rabbinic teachings and traditions are elevated. The extra-biblical is the oral law that I've mentioned so many times to you. They believe that the extra-biblical... Rabbinic teaching traditions, if elevated, if not in the official doctrinal beliefs, then in practice, to the same level of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Although they often speak of keeping the law, they're usually inconsistent in how this is understood and defined. For example, certain laws are either broken or neglected, while a great deal of attention is placed on keeping the Sabbath, Friday sunset through Saturday sunset, and celebrating the feast mentioned in Leviticus 23. These issues will be discussed in more detail below. The past few decades have witnessed a growing influence of this movement among conservative Christians. It is not unusual to see HRM, acronym for Hebrew Roots Movement, proponents give themselves Hebrew names, identify as Torah observant, write God as G-D, eat only kosher foods, claim the New Testament was originally written in Hebrew, or at least several books were, condemn numerous Christian traditions as pagan, and dismiss teachings from Paul's epistles. Some have gone so far as to challenge Orthodox Christian beliefs such as the Trinity or even the deity of Christ. Fundamentally, the HRM teaches that many modern Christian beliefs and practices were introduced to the church by pagan Greeks 
This is why they generally do not like to be identified as Christians. Instead, they believe that they need to recover the first century Hebrew roots of Christianity. One writer summarized their beliefs as follows. It is a very modern movement that insists that we must resurrect first century Judaism, our Jewish roots, and milieu and lifestyle of first century Jews and impose them on both Jewish and non-Jewish believers. This is not just an academic study to better understand scripture in its setting, but is rather a movement of restoration that claims that the church has moved off its Jewish foundation and must return to a more Jewish way of life to be authentic. So it is. And this, of course, is just one, uh, one definition. The thing's a broad spectrum, a lot of different takes on it. Anything you get into is like that. You can't just nail down uh, what one says or one group believes and say they all believe that. You can't. But our concern tonight is that there is one God, one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 2 and verse number 13, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, having not a law, are a law to themselves. The Apostle Paul gives it, goes into a systematic definition of what the law is and how man relates to it. What does it have to do with us? Romans chapter number 4 and verse 15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. And then in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 13, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Notice how he deals with it now. I'm not going to get into all that, that, uh, that, that is, that's involved with that, but that's simply saying to you tonight that every person's accountable to God whether he has the law or not. Right. Even your right. conscience, therefore, is a very gr strong witness as to your relationship with the Lord. But now look at Romans chapter number 7 and verses 8 and 9. This is important. But sin taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now that could easily be applied to childhood until a child reaches the age of accountability. They're alive without the law. They're not condemned by the law until they come to the point to where they can comprehend and receive uh, what, the, what the law has to say. In Galatians chapter number 4 and verse 9, here's what the apostle says, But now after that you've known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, wherein to you desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. The apostle Paul had ample opportunity to tell you to keep the Sabbath, at the Sabbath, Shabbat, he had ample opportunity time and again in the context of what he was talking about and never one time, not one time, did he ever tell you to keep the Sabbath day. But here's what he called it. He said, these are weak and beggarly elements to take a son of God, and that's what you are by the new birth. If you're born again, you're a son of the living God and turn you into a beggar to put you under the bondage of a law that nobody could ever keep. And if you think you're keeping the law tonight, you're a fool. That's right. Amen. Amen. And I'm being nice. Amen. No man has ever kept that law but one. Amen. But one. Yes. But one. He kept it by the letter and by the spirit. Amen. Amen. So the Bible says in Galatians 4 verse 10, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. In Romans chapter number 14, the apostle said, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. The Knoxville, Tennessee that I grew up in, everything was closed on Sunday. They called it blue laws. How many of you remember them? And you respect the people. You respect them because they considered Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. There's not one verse of scripture that calls Sunday the Christian Sabbath, but that's all right. You, you respect your brother until a time when he should know better. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat 
or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. There's going to come a time on this earth called the millennium, and the Old Testament sacrifices and all of that will be reinstated. And why? For a purpose of teaching and comparison and identification. God has his reasons for what he does. But this is what it says in the book of Ezekiel. And you can read the last few chapters of Ezekiel, and it'll pretty well lay it out for you to understand what's going on. The apostle says, a shadow of things to come. In Colossians 2, verse 19, the scripture says, Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using? Yes, yes sir. It's important. It's a big deal when you start messing with the Bible. In Galatians chapter number 3, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, brought you under some kind of a witch's spell, who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. Verse number 6, chapter 3, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Here the apostle is going to compare the law. Which, who gave the law, Abraham or Moses? Of course. And there's a 500-year difference between Moses and Abraham. The blessings did not come through the law, the apostle argues. The blessings came through the promise. They came 500 years before the law was given. Abraham was justified and blessed because he believed God. Therefore, he becomes the father of the faithful. The apostle Paul is arguing with the church at Galatia, those uh, Judaizers that are trying to bring this in. Look what you're doing. Don't you even understand that the law is a late comer? Look at verse number 19 of Galatians chapter number 3. And look what he says. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. You had two mountains in the Old Testament. You had Gerizim and Ebal. The word Ebal in Hebrew literally means fool. That was Abigail's husband. And the, the word Gerizim means to bless them. And so as they came into the land, they separated Israel, put one on one side, one on the other, and they read the blessings and the curses. All right? But they said, all that thou hast said we will do. We'll do it. All right? We'll see if you do it. Their flesh was speaking. In their arrogance and in their ignorance, their flesh spoke. They had to learn the hard way that picking up sticks on the Sabbath day cost a man his life. They had to learn the hard way that God never gave them the law to save them. He gave them the law to convict them, teach them, instruct them, and lead them. The Bible says that it was added because of transgressions, which leads you to believe that the law might not have been necessarily given to begin with. It was only because of their reaction and their attitude that he gave them the law. You see, God works on conditional things. Remember the New Testament, conditional when it talks about John the Baptist, the Bible said he was born, came forth with the spirit of Elijah. He would have that spirit upon him. At the time, no one, no one thought much about it, but wind up, John the Baptist could have been Elijah. So we read here, it was added because of transgression. The apostle says in Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. It's a curse. It's a burden. It's a weak and beggarly element. The apostle does not speak against the law in the sense that the law is bad because he says the law is holy. Yes. It's the law is holy, but it's separate unto God. So in Galatians chapter number four and verse number 21, he says, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Do so I know who that bondmaid was? That's right. And who was her son? 
Ishmael, ask of God. That's what that name means. He's still around, by the way. Still got a problem here now. The problem between the Jew and the Arab goes all the way back to Hagar and Abraham. Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. They're kin to each other. <laughs> yes, it does. It goes all the way back to Ishmael. God, Abraham said to the Lord, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Young strapling boy. God said, Not so. He said, The promise will not come through him. The promise will come through Yitzhak or Isaac, laughter. That's where the promise is going to come through. The promise is going to come through the promise and by the promise. And not by your help, Abraham. I don't need your, don't need your help. God's going to do it, and he did it. He did it. So the Bible says that it is written, Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, Mitzrayim, the ancient name for Egypt, the Egyptian. And it wasn't her fault to be an Egyptian. And when she was driven forth out into the wilderness, she cried, thought she was going to die. And God sent an angel and bore her up, and took care of her, and said her son would become the head of a great people. God's a good God. He's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. But you could never get the promise through Hagar. It could never come that way. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now what he's doing is using an analogy because he's talking about the Jerusalem that is there 2,000 years ago that is under the bondmaid. It is bound to the law. It is living under a curse. The promise cannot come that way. Salvation could never come that way. The promised seed could never come that way. So he tells them in verse number 26. Verse 25, he says, Agar, which is Hagar, is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Let me tell you something, folks. 2,000 years later, nothing's changed. They're still in bondage. They're still in bondage. But there's more to know now. Because the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, God's merciful. He's a gracious, long-suffering God. He blinds them. Why would he blind them 2,000 years ago for those alive today? See, they think it through. There's a reason for that. He blinded them so that he could save them. But every time anyone is ever saved, it's always individually, and it's an individual accountability to God. Yes. Amen. You've got to keep that in mind. Amen. An individual accountability to God. Do you want the truth? You'll get the truth. If you don't want the truth, the truth can be staring you in the face and you reject it. This is why the apostle said in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, because they love not the truth, but took pleasure in unrighteousness for this cause, God will send them a strong delusion. They might believe a lie and be damned. To have the truth and reject the truth is one of the worst sins there is on the face of this earth. Yes, it is. That's a horrible, horrible thing because you don't want the truth. So he says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free which is the mother of us all. So you can, you, can, you, can, you can put your stock in one of two Jerusalems. The one that's here on this earth, and I've been there now five, six times, a beautiful old city, believe me. <laughs> it's a sight to behold. But it's in bondage. Yerushalayim, the city of peace. David's the one that set it free and was able to, and when he did, he made it the capital of Israel when he did that. Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. He said, but the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Which Jerusalem is that, you suppose? That's right, exactly. That's the new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. Well, did he make that new Jerusalem? In a sense, he did. But in a sense, that new Jerusalem is a work in progress. Because the gates and the foundations have to do with the, the apostles of the Lamb and the 12 tribes of Israel. And the names that are written in that new Jerusalem are written there continually. In other words, it's not fin finished. It's not complete. It's a work in progress. It's the bride of the Lamb. It is written, Rejoice, barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou, travel, thou, <clears throat> thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Amen. 
The Lord Jesus Christ, folks, is everything. And he's not part of anything. He's all in all. Yes, he is. He's everything we need. To look for something outside of him is to diminish him. Is to say that you're not complete in him. To seek anything outside of the Lord Jesus Christ is to say that there's something valuable outside of him. And there isn't. For the Bible says in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and so forth. He is the Lamb of God. So therefore, when you try to drag some weak and beggarly element, I don't care what it is, and you try to connect that to the Lord Jesus Christ and say Christ is great, but watch the ones with the buts <laughs> because they're going to get you in trouble. They're in trouble themselves. You've got to be awful careful with it. So what's going on? What's really going on? First of all, Christ first told his disciples not to go to Gentiles, didn't he? It's not take the meat to the children, cast it to dogs. He called a Phoenician woman a dog. That's what your Bible says. Did he say that because he had some personal animus against her? No, 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 no. Why? Because this was early on in the ministry of Christ when he was coming to the Jew, to the Jew first, and he was offering them the kingdom of heaven. And he began to preach the kingdom of heaven to them. He offered himself as the kingdom of heaven, offered to them the kingdom of heaven and himself as the king of the kingdom of heaven. And it's quite a remarkable thing to watch a king when he's coronated. I watched Charles III yesterday when they coronated him as the king of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, the British Commonwealth, and the realms. Almost two and a half billion people. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came, his throne was a cross. And his crown was a crown of thorns. But he told them, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Not of this world in the sense it's not this world, this physical world. It's this age that I'm in right now. He said, if it was, then would my servants fight. So all of you passive Christians, you need to take a good look at that. Amen. Behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness. He that judge and make peace. Did I mess up? Judge and make war. That's why I told them to buy a sword. We're not here to get into sedition, overthrow governments. Why? Because we're not building a kingdom here. We're not building, we're not building anything for that matter. The Lord Jesus is building his church. Upon this rock I build my church. We, we be good citizens. We obey the laws of the land. We do our best to get along with our neighbors. And we try to show the light, becoming the salt of the earth, and the light of the world. That's what we do. That's what we do. We don't belong to any group that's trying to overthrow the government. Sometimes the government that Christians have been under and are at this moment in this world are some of the most godless, filthy, vile, corrupt pieces of garbage that ever came forth from the pen of a man. Now, I'm not talking about America, but you know there are places like that in this world. Believe me. And they persecute the Christians and they'll kill them in a heartbeat. But they still don't overthrow that government. Their place is to serve Christ. That is as a Christian. Now when they in 1776 and King George III, and uh, he's got a little statue over there in London. It's real small. Compare it to Queen Victoria's monument there that you saw yesterday. It's quite a difference because King George lost the colonies. <laughs> Queen Victoria gained the world. That was at the height of the British Empire, the largest empire the, earth, the world has ever known. The sun never set on the British Empire. And right now, those that are under the queen, or the king now, he's the king, take up a third of the earth's surface. A third, folks, a third of this whole world comes under the, uh, the authority of, this, uh, of the king, king, uh, king Charles III. And a third of the population of this world is under the uh, Union Jack Great Britain. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. That's something to think about because that's an enormous amount of power. Some folks call, they say that King Charles is the, uh, the Antichrist. No, I don't go to jump on, you know, you can hear everything in the world. If you get on YouTube, type anything in it and you'll get a response. 
And out of that response, half of them will be experts. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just take it with a grain of salt, all this stuff. I don't believe, I'm not saying I believe it for a minute that the king of, of England is the Antichrist. Not so, not so. But in any event, the kingdom of this world 2,000 years ago was not his kingdom. He offered it to the Jew, and the Jew rejected it, the kingdom of heaven. He offered it, they rejected it. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the transition from a purely Jewish offer of the kingdom to the Gentiles being included. Amen. We start with the dog, and now we wind up, go ye therefore in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Gentiles are included yes. in the Great Commission. So here we go. Number three, once the Jewish element was settled, once it was settled, God called the apostle Paul and sent him to the Gentiles. So what do you mean by Jewish element? They had a second opportunity in the book of Acts to receive the king, and they refused again. And so therefore, God turned to the Gentiles. Yeah. Turned to the Gentiles. Yeah. And the first thing he did was to save the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, and call him as the apostle to the Gentiles. Therefore, he writes half the New Testament because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. These are things that are so helpful if you begin to, uh, if you get, to get a hold of it. The, uh, none of these apostles preached the blood and the cross like Paul did until they heard him preach it. None of them. None of them had a hold of that. As I told you this morning, even the apostle Peter, when God told him to go to Cornelius, who was a centurion, he was a Roman soldier, but he was a, he was a proselyte, uh, and enter into his house. Not so, Lord. Well, now, how does that work with evangelism? Did Peter really think that he was going to go and evangelize Gentiles? I don't think he had it for, in his mind for a moment. But in any event, Paul did. Paul did. Yes, he did. He immediately went to the Gentiles and began to preach to them. Once the Jewish element was settled, God called the Apostle Paul and sent him to the Gentiles. Then to him was revealed the constitution of the kingdom of God in the church of God. So what's that mean? That means that the epistles of Paul, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and probably Hebrews, were written by one man. And it takes up the... It takes up the the, the majority of the New Testament text, and it is the foundation of doctrine for what we believe. Now, here we go. Here we have the Hebrew roots movement, some of these people telling you that Paul was not a, was not a genuine apostle. They even had that problem at Corinth, if you remember reading the yeah. first Corinthians. Yeah. They challenged his authority. They challenged it. And one of the reasons that they challenged the authority of the apostle Paul is because he was not one of the twelve. He said, I was one chosen out of due time. That's right. Yes, he was not one of the 12. But he said, surely the signs of an apostle were wrought by me. That's right. And they certainly were. Amen. So he had the constitution of the kingdom. What does that mean? That means the foundation of it, the basis of it, the construction of it. And the first part of that foundation would be, I declare unto you the gospel. And what is that? How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And the word baptized is nowhere to be found. Not in the gospel that the apostle preached. And then, to this was added, in other words, to what the apostle had done when he laid down the foundation of the New Testament church. To this was added, as the last gospel, John, late in the formation of the canon. And here's what John gives us. The Gospel of John is long after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It comes along when the apostle has laid the foundation down for the New Testament church. And the apostle John, the one he said, you're not going to die until you see me come. So when did he see him come? Anybody know that tonight? When exactly. Revelation. He saw him come. But if you look at this thing now, to this was added as the last gospel, late in the formation of the canon, number one. Not one word about the kingdom of heaven. It's not to be found in the gospel of John. Not a word. Not a word. 
The doctrine of the new birth is introduced. Not one word in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is said about the new birth. Not one word, not one time. It is in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. Nicodemus, you must be born again. So why did we late? Why did we wait until so late to preach the gospel of the new birth? Well, one of the reasons is this, that the New Testament was not in force, had no power, had no authority until the death of the testator. The Lord Jesus Christ had to die on that cross to give it authority. And until the New Testament was given authority, nobody was born again. Because the only way to be born again is by the New Testament, the new covenant of his blood. And that didn't happen until he died. And then the last thing that the apostles, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record for us is his death. And they essentially close out their gospels. But John picks it up and says you must be born again. Where applicable, Christ is revealed as the fulfillment of all that the Jewish feast days looked forward to. Of all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only one records three Passovers. John. Why is that important? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. What's he done? The Apostle John in the Gospel of John has said, Take your Jewish feast days, respect them, but they mean nothing compared to the real Passover. And the real Passover is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's basic, folks, with no Passover, no salvation. No Passover, no blood atonement. No Passover, none of that. For the Passover was the beginning of our salvation. So he says then finally, or again, he says, simple faith in Christ, the Apostle Paul so elegantly argued in Galatians, is the theme of the book. The whole Gospel of John, these things are written that ye might believe. The word believe shows up four or five times as many at times as it does in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The gospel of John is full of believe. So what do you need to do to be saved, preacher? Believe. Believe. Over and over and over and over again. Put faith in Christ. Believe. And that's it. I mean, then there are other things, but for the, for the sake of time tonight, to show you how, that the New Testament comes together and it makes sense. If you can see it in the light that I'm trying to give to you tonight, makes sense. And I didn't get that overnight. A lot of that came on my knees from God explaining to me why. Why, is, why. why did he send this Gentile woman away and called her a dog? And then later on she comes in because something had happened. There's a transition that took place. That opens the door. If you let God open the door in your mind, begin to show you something, and you'll receive it, he'll give you more. Amen. That's one of the great things about studying the Bible. If you'll receive it, he gives you more. Then he gives you more. Then he gives you more. You say, how do I know I'm getting the truth? Take it back to the Bible and prayer. Let the Holy Spirit confirm in your heart that what you're reading, the scriptures, and the way you interpret it, he interprets it for you. The Holy Ghost is their teacher. He shall lead you or guide you into all truth. That's what he said he would do. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. See how the Apostle Paul takes a powerful, strong Jewish feast day and makes Christ that feast day. He is the Passover. Then in Galatians chapter number 1 in verses 6 and 9, this is a warning for you tonight. When you preach is, you know, preachers, I, Lord have mercy, I have no idea how many words I've said since I've been up here. <laughs> 46 years, good night. I can't even tell you how many times I've preached. But I'm not changing the Bible. I'm not rewriting the scripture. Amen. That's what's important. Leave the book alone. Amen. That's what's important, folks. Leave the book alone. I listened yesterday to the Archbishop of Canterbury and some of the clergy over there in the Church of England as they read the scripture. How many of you heard them read scripture yesterday? What scripture were they reading? What book were they reading from? I mean, what, what Bible? That one right there. <laughs> I thought to myself, this is remarkable. They were reading from the King James Bible. Well, they ought to. King James was the king of England. Amen. <laughs> and so, uh, listen to this. 
I marvel that your soul soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Amen. As we said before, so say we now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. So let me, I'll close with this tonight, but let me, let me give you something to instruct that will help you because I take it very seriously. I have changed my attitude about some things in 46 years. I've told you that before. Prayed and God showed me, gave me more light on it. And I moved away from some positions and moved into others. But I have never changed this book. Same book. My King James Bible reads exactly as your King James Bible. I didn't cross any words out and change it. Didn't do that. That's what's important. One of the uh, translators of the NIV, I think it was the NIV, said uh, he, he got scared because he realized what they'd done. And he said, uh, I fear we may be in trouble with God. Those were his words. To paraphrase him, I don't to quote him exactly, I fear that we may be in trouble with God. Why? Because they've been messing with God's word. Right. Don't mess with it, folks. No. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with it. In the Old Testament, a fellow named Jehudi took a pen knife, didn't like what he had, and he cut it and threw it into the fire. Yeah, yeah they, that's in the Bible. <laughs> he didn't like it. So if you don't like the Bible today, you're not, the, you're not original. They were around a long time ago. They don't like it. Even the Old Testament, they twist it. They say, they say prophesy unto us smooth things. <laughs> you know, I guess everybody likes to hear something smooth every once in a while. But the truth of the matter is, I want the truth. And I believe the Bible. I believe it. And by the grace of God, I'm not going to change that book. Leave it as it is. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight, the time we have together, preach it and teach it. The singing we've had, Father, the special music. Lord, the time we've had in your house together. And Father, for the testimony this morning, Lord, and Savannah. And our Father, this little boy that we're praying for, the little two-year-old Colton. Remember him. Remember Harley, Father, down there in Nashville. Remember her. And our Father, remember the sick that we've... We've gotten emails about Sister Presley's sister. We lift her up before you tonight. God, you know, you can heal. It's up to you. It's, she's in your hands. We pray for her. We pray in Jesus' name, Lord. You know who we are. You know we have no power in ourselves. Don't claim any. Don't have any. The power is in Christ. We pray your blessing. We come to you in his sweet holy name now. And bless your word. Amen and amen.